Okay, in this lecture, we are going to be expanding our understanding of radio wave propagation uh, to materials for which there is some loss or some attenuation to those radio waves. This will, to some extent, mirror what we covered back in transmission lines when we consider transmission line with losses, but we're now going to see it in the context of radio waves. So this lecture is divided into three sections. The first will be on the physical origins of the attenuation of waves. Then we'll quantify that mathematically, and then we'll talk about a special case of good conductors, which is an ironic name because it's actually a poor conductor of radio waves, but it's a good conductor of electricity. So let's start out with the physical origin of wave attenuation and loss. So let me just start by um, uh, drawing a simple diagram here. And the way we think about a radio wave propagating is let's say we have an electric field that's pointed in this direction. And uh, uh, we are propagating this radio wave in this direction. We're gonna call this beta bar. Uh, beta bar indicates the direction of propagation. Let me make that a, um, a beta as a vector. Uh, beta represented what we call the wave number, right? And so if we look at the evolution of the wave with distance, then if we take a look at two points, that are one meter apart, how many radians apart have we traversed along this waveguide? Um, it's uh, um, equal to two pi divided by the wavelength and it's pointed in the direction of propagation. So let's say we're oriented or we're propagating the way this arrow is going here. If we do that, then we know that E cross H will be in the direction of propagation. So the magnetic field associated with this wave will be coming out of the page here. This will be the magnetic field direction. So E cross H is in the direction of uh, beta bar. Now this was for a perfect non-conducting um, uh, material. However, in the, in the case where the material has some loss, what's gonna happen is there's gonna be a non-zero conductivity to it, right? So sigma, the conductivity is greater than zero. And so the moment you apply this electric field, you're going to generate a current that will be probably parallel to the electric field, assuming sigma is just a number. And there'll be a current here, which equals to sigma times that electric field. All right, now let's consider what's happening in the absence of this current. In the absence of this current, the electric field and magnetic field are moving together. Let me just kind of color code this for a second. Let's make the magnetic field in blue. And in an ordinary wave, the electric field would have this sinusoidal variation, it's moving, and the electric field would be coincident with that. It would sort of line up, the peaks and valleys would line up. Um, that would be the magnetic field moving this way, um, whereas the electric field is uh, um, moving in the same direction and everything lines up. Now, the moment that we place this uh, parasitic current here, this J equals sigma E, Let's think about this as a steady DC current. And what that's going to do is it's going to create a magnetic field as well, a secondary magnetic field. Now, point your thumb in the direction of that current where that red arrow is going and curl your fingers around. And that's going to give you a secondary magnetic field generated by this current. And it's basically going to be going into the board on this side, right? So this is, uh, I'm gonna call this H secondary and it's gonna be coming out of the board on this side since it circles around this electric field right here. What you'll notice is that this uh, um, magnetic field right here, it's going uh, into the page, is counteracting the sort of main magnetic field which is trying to move to the right. And so in doing so, it's like this current that appeared, this J equals sigma E, is almost like working against the motion of the magnetic field. And there's gonna be two things that are going to result from that. Right, so this is what we will call the lossless case. Two things will result from that. The first is that the signal is going to weaken as it goes down the line. The second is that we're going to have a little bit of a lag or a phase shift between the electric field and the magnetic field. So whereas the peaks and valleys lined up perfectly for the lossless case, um, here, we're going to have a lag between them. So the peaks and valleys will no longer line up between the electric field and the magnetic field. Right? This would be the magnetic field in 
blue and the electric field in black. All right, so this will be the lossy case or when there is some loss to the material. And uh, we're not going to treat that mathematically. So well, what's going to happen is we have this notion of beta. Uh, beta is a vector that points in the direction of propagation. Uh, and beta was just um, a, uh, a, a real number. What we're going to do is going to replace it with something called k. And uh, uh, k is going to account for both the propagation as well as the attenuation, much like what we did with transmission lines. So there are two ways in which a material could impede the flow or slow down and attenuate waves. The first is what I just covered here, which is a direct conductivity. So any non-zero conductivity to the material, the moment you have an electric field that's associated with that radio wave, you have a current that's set up. But there's a second mechanism. And for that, I want to remind you that we've got this... Uh, a notion of a dielectric um, uh, property of any material, that if we apply an electric field in this direction, then we are going to have a slight tendency to align molecules with a positive side oriented this way and a negative side oriented that way. Right? But now consider the fact that this electric field is part of a radio wave, which means there's a frequency to it. So it's, it's oscillating back and forth as a, as a single sine wave. So if we're standing right here, then the electric field that you observe is gonna be jumping up and down in a sinusoid or variation. Now imagine we turn that frequency really, really high and it's oscillating very quickly is this electric field. Then this molecule right here is gonna have a tendency to wiggle back and forth so that the positive side is always facing in the direction of the electric field. At a certain point though, this molecule has a bit of a sluggishness to it. It's got some inertia. It doesn't like to turn infinitely fast. There's a lag to it, which is to say that the polarization that's induced no longer is lined up and synchronized with the electric field. What that means uh, practically is that we have this notion that the polarization vector P equals a susceptibility chi times the applied electric field. Remember chi measures just how good the material is at aligning all its molecules with the electric field. But now we're going to have a lag because the wiggling back and forth of this molecule will not be able to keep up with the fast electric field. And so we're actually gonna write this in the following way, right? The polarization vector will be equal to some um, amplitude and then e to the minus j times phi times the electric field. And the phase, is basically going to tell us how slow is it? How, how much is that wiggling of the molecule slowing itself down and sluggish compared to the oscillation of the electric field? Practically, me, practically speaking, what that means is that the permittivity epsilon is also going to be a complex number. And that is going to work out to be mathematically equivalent to a conductivity. This, as it turns out, is going to... Uh, um, attenuate the wave and absorb some energy, basically steal some away. And we'll, we'll see that mathematically. So we're going to have to redefine our notion of um, dielectric constant. So epsilon, we're going to redefine this in the following way. We're going to have an epsilon prime minus J times epsilon double prime. This is our new way of breaking apart the permittivity into two component pieces. This is the real part. This is what we've been. This is what we studied in the past. Um, it's a consistent wiggling back and forth of the molecule, and this uh, second part right here is the imaginary parts, and that's going to tell us something about how much energy is lost because that molecule cannot wiggle back and forth fast enough. Now, as you might imagine, epsilon double prime is going to be a function of the frequency meaning if the electric field is oscillating extraordinarily quickly, then eventually you're gonna reach a point where the molecule can't keep up. But if the electric field is very slow, it's a very low frequency, then the molecule can kind of turn back and forth and keep up with it. So this uh, a complex permittivity epsilon is going to be a function of frequency and that is an important thing. All right, another way to characterize 
this uh, uh, dielectric, it was something called the loss tangent. And this is sometimes written with a lowercase delta. And it's just the ratio of epsilon double prime over epsilon prime. Uh, these are, by the way, properties you can look up in a, a paper or a textbook. You know, what is the loss tangent and what is the, the dielectric permittivity of, for example, seawater? That's something that you can look up that's kind of known as a, as a material property. All right, now let me show you a little bit of how this works in practice. All right, and when we talk about notion of molecules wiggling, we are basically um, asking the question of how quickly, what it, do they have a natural oscillation frequency? And most molecules do have a natural speed that they like to wiggle back and forth at. It's a little bit like a, um, if I have a pendulum, it's gonna have a natural oscillation frequency to it. Molecules have that too. And when you drive a molecule at a specific frequency that it likes to wiggle at, it's gonna have an extra tendency to absorb that energy. And that's what we call a resonance. And so what you're seeing right here on the top right is an effect of that in terms of radio wave propagation. Um, so on the X axis in this plot is frequency in gigahertz. And the vertical axis is basically how quickly radio waves are being attenuated in units of decibels per kilometer. So for every kilometer, you're losing that much decibel of, uh, of either power or uh, electric field amplitude. And what you'll notice is that in air, there are these little spikes right here at different frequencies. And as it turns out, these correspond precisely to resonance frequencies of the different components of air. For example, water has a nice big resonance right around 23 gigahertz. And when you drive water um, at uh, 23 gigahertz, it's gonna absorb a little extra energy, which is another way of saying that that complex part of the permittivity is unusually high. And so since there's water vapor in, in air, um, you're, you're gonna get a spike right there. You also have a big 60 a gil, uh, a gigahertz attenuation from oxygen, and there's a bunch of these up and down the line. Um, and so if you plot the real and imaginary part of the dielectric constant, epsilon equals epsilon prime minus J epsilon double prime, and that's what's plotted in the top and bottom here, you'll often see the imaginary part sort of spike um, right around when you reach this resonance and then fall again. And uh, um, this is called the bi model of molecular absorption. Uh, let me show you another example. This is uh, um, the attenuation of radio waves. And there's that uh, uh, 23 gigahertz absorption from water vapor. And here's a couple of uh, um, oxygen absorption points. So it's very difficult to propagate at 60 gigahertz because Basically, oxygen wiggles very nicely, precisely at that frequency, and it absorbs the energy very quickly. Um, the implication of this, as you might guess, is because water vapor uh, can absorb waves around 23 gigahertz, that the relative humidity of air is going to impact the propagation um, efficiency of air. And in fact, that's the case. So let me show you this plot right here. Uh, this is, again, uh, frequency on the x-axis spanning from 10 to 1,000 gigahertz, or this is one terahertz up here. Uh, and again, the vertical axis is the attenuation rate in decibels per kilometer of propagation. And the different plots here are different values of the relative humidity of air, from 0% or perfectly dry air in blue to 100% humidity and the existence of fog on the very top. And notice how this 60 gigahertz component right here, that's uh, oxygen absorption doesn't really change at all as a function of humidity. But look at this spike right here. This 23 gigahertz spike is dramatically different as a function of humidity, right? So the makeup of air is actually going to impact the propagation of radio waves, especially as you get higher in frequency. Um, out into the 20, 30, 40 gigahertz range, it starts to make a big difference. And this is important because basically all of 5G applications are all sitting right here in this band. Uh, and the next sort of wave of big, of big applications are going to be sitting here past 100 gigahertz. Uh, and so um, these uh, sort of impacts of air itself kind of matter a lot. And your choice of frequency uh, can make a dramatic difference in um, how efficient your radio wave is propagating. Uh, let me also show you this, that water and ice also has dramatically different um, impacts 
basically to have resonance at very different frequencies. Ice has a resonance right around um, a few kilohertz, right? This uh, dashed line right here is the dielectric loss, um, which reaches the peak around uh, a few kilohertz. And water's got a resonance at a much higher frequency, more like 10 gigahertz, right? Or the, 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 the 20 gigahertz that we talked about. And this also, by the way, can tell you a little bit about how a microwave works. Uh, a microwave basically works because 2.4, four or five gigahertz is chosen to be a nice frequency that um, uh, water can absorb. And so you're using the fact that uh, any food that you put in a microwave is gonna have some lossy dielectric nature to it. And so, uh, um, you know, when you apply 2.45 gigahertz to this potato, uh, some of that energy is going to be observed. It's going to be absorbed by the dielectric loss inside the water that's contained inside that potato. Um, great uh, cocktail hour. Uh, um, line about, you know, how a microwave works. Well, I'll just say lossy dielectric absorption of electromagnetic waves. And everyone will say, oh, of course. So that's uh, section one here on the physical origins of wave loss. In part two, we are going to actually see the math and uh, quantify the attenuation of radio waves um, as a, a function of conductivity, as well as the dielectric properties of a certain material.